Um, I have a question for both uh, Noam and Marvin that I think is on the minds of many people in this room, and I know it's been expressed in some of the questions that I've received by email prior to this event, that there is a, a narrative in which the new direction of uh, both artificial intelligence and cognitive science is one that makes a great deal more use of probabilistic information that is gleaned from enormous amounts of uh, experience during learning. This is a, uh, manifested in branches of cognitive science such as uh, neural networks and connectionism, Bayesian inference models, uh, application of machine learning to intelligence, many of the models both of uh, Tommy Poggio and uh, Josh Tenenbaum. Uh, in the classic work from the golden age, and indeed in many of the models since then, including the, the models of uh, generative grammar and models of semantic memory, uh, probabilities don't play a big role. Uh, is the narrative that says that the direction of the field is in making use of massive amounts of statistical information via learning, uh, well, maybe I'll, I'll ask you to complete that sentence. Uh, what is the, uh, uh, I'll let, let you complete the sentence. Noam? There's, uh, it's, I mean, it's true, there's been a lot of work on uh, trying to apply uh, statistical uh, models to various linguistic problems. Uh, I think there have been some successes, but a lot of failures. The successes, to my knowledge at least, you know, there's no time to go into details, but the successes that I know of are those that integrate statistical analysis with some uh, a universal grammar property, some fundamental properties of language. When they're integrated, you sometimes do get results. Uh, it's, uh, the simplest case, maybe, is uh, the problem of uh, identifying words in a running discourse. And something apparently children do, you know. They hear a running discourse, they pick out units. And the obvious units are words, which are really phonological units. Um, and uh, and uh, there's a natural property that I wrote about it in the 1950s. I mean, it was just taken for granted that if you just take a look at the, if, if you have a series of sounds and you look at the transitional probabilities at each point, what's likely to come next, uh, when you get to a word boundary, the probabilities go way down. You don't know what's coming next. If it's internal to a word, you can predict pretty well. So if you kind of trace transitional probabilities, you ought to get something like word boundaries. Actually, it's, I wrote about it in 1955. And I assume that that's correct. Turns out to be false. Uh, it was shown actually by Charles Yang, a former student here, a PhD in the computer science department, that. Uh, if you apply that method, it basically gives syllables uh, in a language like English. Uh, on the other hand, if you apply that message under a constraint, namely the constraint that a word has what's called a prosodic peak, you know, like a pitch stress peak, which is true, then, then you get much better results. Now, there's more recent work, which is still in press, by Shukla and Aslan and others, which shows that you get still better results if you apply that uh, together with uh, what are called prosodic phrases. I mean, it turns out that the, you know, a, an express a sentence, let's say, has units, uh, units of pitch and stress and so on, which are connected, related to the syntactic structure, actually in ways which were studied. Uh, maybe first seriously by another former student, Lisa Selkirk, a colleague of Barbara. Uh, but uh, when you connect, when you interact prosodic peaks with transitional probabilities, then you get a pretty good identification of word boundaries. Uh, well, you know, that's the kind of work that I think makes sense if you, uh, uh, and there are more complex examples, but uh, it's a simple example of the kind of thing that can work. On the other hand, there's a lot of work which tries to do sophisticated statistical analysis, you know, Bayesian and so on and so forth, without any concern for the uh, actual structure of language. As far as I'm aware, that 
only achieves success in a very odd sense of success. There is a notion of success which has developed in uh, computational cognitive science in recent years, which I think is novel in the history of science. It interprets success as uh, approximating unanalyzed data. So for example, if you were, say, to study B communication this way, instead of doing the complex experiments that B scientists do, you know, like having bees fly to an island uh, to see if they have leave an odor trail and this sort of thing, if you simply did extensive videotaping of bees swarming, okay, and you did you know, a lot of statistical analysis of it, uh, you would get a pretty good prediction for what bees are likely to do next time they swarm. Actually, you get a better prediction than bee scientists do, and they wouldn't care because they're not trying to do that. Uh, but, and, and you can make it a better and better approximation by more videotapes and more statistics and so on. I mean, actually, you could do physics this way. Uh, instead of studying things like balls rolling down frictionless planes, which can't happen in nature, uh, if you uh, uh, took a ton of videotapes of what's happening outside my office window, let's say, you know, leaves flying and various things, and you did an extensive analysis of them, you would get some kind of prediction of what's likely to happen next, certainly way better than anybody in the physics department could give. Well, that's a notion of success, which is, I think, novel. I don't know of anything like it in the history of science. Uh, and in, in those terms, you get some kind of successes. And if you look at the literature in the field, a lot of these papers are listed as successes. And when you look at them carefully, they're successes in this particular sense, and not the sense that science has ever been interested in. But it does give you ways of approximating unanalyzed data, you know, analysis of corpus and so on and so forth. I don't know of any other cases, frankly. I mean, so there are successes where things are integrated with some of the properties of language, but I know of, at least I know of none in which they're not. Thank you. To my uh, tremendous regret, and I imagine of many people in the audience, I'm going to have to bring the proceedings to uh, a close, and we'll have to uh, be left with Patrick's uh, interpretation of what Marvin's response would have been to the question. Uh, I'd like to thank Sidney Brenner, Marvin Minsky, Noam Chomsky, Emilio Bitsi, Barbara Partee, Patrick Winston for an enormously stimulating session, and thanks to all of you.